Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. In this video, we're going to look at feature perturbation ranking. So this is a feature ranking algorithm. It tells you how important different features are for the prediction of a particular type of model. Now, feature perturbation can be used against any type of model. It's not unique to say neural networks where you're summing up weights at the different layers or random forests where you're counting the number of splits in the different trees to determine the importance of a feature. It uses completely predictions, so you don't have to retrain, you don't have to do really anything other than run the algorithm against it. I show you an implementation that I put into my set of Kaggle utilities that you can use to run against any model that you've trained against the Kaggle data set. And of course, if you find this kind of thing interesting, please subscribe to my channel and click the little bell so that you're notified of any additional videos that I create. Perturbation feature ranking works like this. First of all, let's look at the single variate variable importance approach. Here you have a number of features, and what you're going to do is generate additional data sets. Now you'll generate additional data sets but you won't have to retrain the model. This is one of the key importances of this type of feature ranking. No need to retrain the model because that can take a long time. So you need to keep a saved binary copy of your model for sure, but you're going to take the data set. Now this could be the data set that the neural network or other model was trained with, or it could be an entirely new data set that you want to know which variables are important for that new data set. That's another very important aspect of this for measuring training set um, shift and feature drift. So we go one by one. We're going to take feature one, feature two, feature three, and create a new training set for each of those. So if you have five features, you're going to create five different training sets. Here we're doing the perturbation for feature four. We take feature four and we shuffle it, kind of like the cards in a deck. We're not changing the numbers, but we're taking that column and essentially flipping those values all around. The importance of shuffling compared to, say, putting all zeros in or putting random numbers in is your key statistical features will remain the same. You still have the same distribution. You still have the same mean, max, min, and median values for that column. However, that column is pretty much worthless now for, for scoring. So now you take that entire data set with feature four shuffled and you rescore it. You score it with a log loss or an AUC or whatever, whatever method that you're using to, to evaluate your actual model. It's another importance of this. It is linked to the type of error metric that you're actually using compared to, to the model-specific ways of evaluating feature importance. Then you do it for feature five. Of course, you've done it with feature one, two, and three. And you look at the score for each of these perturbations. So if feature four was really, really important, then when you shuffle it and black it out, basically, and now rescore re that model with feature four completely messed up, if that feature was important, then your error is going to get much, much worse on that, on that model with that data set. If feature four was not that important, then it's going to barely phase it. So this is how you determine which features are the most important using the perturbation ranking algorithm. Now, one important characteristic of this is you can look at a multivariable importance. I don't do this too much with just random features, but if you do want to look at how important an interaction is where you have two features together, you can do this. You would black out feature one and feature four. And now with both of those shuffled, you evaluate and you look at what the, what the error happened as a result of this and you compare that to the baseline error with everything there. Now where this can be important is dummy variables. Notice all those features at the left. If you took a categorical like the, the, the famous three 
irises in the Fisher iris data set, and you had a categorical of three different species of flower, you're going to have three dummy variables most likely. The problem with evaluating the features one by one by one is those that species became three features now, three dummy variables. So you, you can get a very interesting report where you see if one species as an input is more important than the others. Now, of course, the iris species are usually the target or the output of, of that particular data set, but if they, were, if they happen to be the input, if you had three dummy variables as the input, you might want to shuffle all three of those dummies together, and that will give you then a, um, a single feature importance for that entire categorical variable. So something else just to keep in mind. So now let's take a look at how you would actually use feature ranking in my set of Kaggle utilities. This Python file here called importance. This is under the examples under the Santander transaction Kaggle challenge and you will put in a new value here for which model you want to evaluate. So if we look at the directory that I have set up for these, as you recall, my Kaggle Utilities, when you train a new model, it generates one of these folders. And this folder gives you additional files that you can work with to ensemble multiple models together or evaluate feature importance or a variety of other, other things. If you open up one of them, like this is a, this is a light gradient boost model that I created. This is a good example because I had engineered some features and I used feature ranking to tell me how important they are. If I open it up, you can see that I keep saved models. These are actual saves from light gradient boosting. And those will be used to evaluate each of those perturbations that we're going to, that we're going to use. The text file that it generates contains basic statistics for that model. Now this contains most of most of the model types that I've implemented for my Kaggle utilities will give you a model specific feature ranking. So this one is is no different. It gives you one here. There's a lot of data in here. Uh, those are the columns that it was completely trained on. This is the feature, the model specific feature importance. So here you can see I usually normalize these to one. This is specific to the light GBM. This is counting the number of branches for each of these variables. And then I normalize them to one so that basically one is the most important feature and on down. So you can see 0 0.97, that's pretty important compared to this. Your most important feature will always be one. That's the baseline by which all others are compared. And these are all just the columns that had originally come with that data set. What's interesting, and this is pretty much a utter slam by, by a light GBM on my engineered features that I was trying in this experiment, but notice these ones at the bottom. Those are my engineered features. So yeah, they're not, they're not that helpful at all. I will drop that particular feature experiment and move on to something else. Now, if you want to use perturbation ranking, you go back to here, and we're just going to basically create a new model, a new model definition, and you always go back and you grab that folder name. It is this one. Interestingly, this one here with a 90 AUC versus the 89 is, is, uh, the one before I added my features. So yes, you can create a model or engineered features that are so bad that they actually decrease the accuracy of the model. You would think that they would figure out just not to use them, but no, they're a distraction. So here I put it in, and then the rest of the the rest of the, the code in this file you can you can just leave as is. I put my other models here is that way I can I could run them, and I am going to basically execute this. and it will begin to run. 
Now you'll notice that it will display a progress bar here in just a second because here you, here you go. There's 201 total features that it is looking at. So it needs to basically load up that model and, and run it with each of those features perturbed and compare the scores. Now this has gone for 17 seconds and this is going to take potentially up to 29 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and essentially fast forward this one so that you can, um, you don't want to wait for this. is going through the, the paces is the CPU load at least with light GBM is pretty high so this is good all these tasks are 100% parallelizable you could you could in theory have a grid of 201 computers for all 201 features and complete this nearly instantly so this is something I might look at in the future of this version is maybe using spark or something such as that to truly parallelize this but you don't have to worry about threads even though it's running serially light gbm at least in this case is making full use of the cpu other model types may not perform as well some are definitely more efficient than others on their cpu usage if you're using a model that is only putting this say at 50 percent then using threads would potentially help Let's look at the output file from it. So when the perturbation ranking algorithm that I wrote runs, it puts a CSV file there, perturb. So you can basically use that file any way you want to. You can generate a bar plot or something. That's a quite common way to do this. And I show the error that is being reported on each of these. Now, the error is not... For this, I, I have it simply use a generic error type. So it uses RMSE for regression and log loss for classification. You can modify this to use really any one that you want to, and you might get better feature ranking if you actually modify it to use, say, AUC, if that's what the particular competition is dealing with. Typically, I just use the defaults so that um, it, I don't find that it makes much, much difference in terms of the actual importance ranking. Here you'll see feature 81, 12, these are the actual names that Kaggle gave these, are the most important ones. And if you scroll down to um, you'll see the feature 81, 12, and so on are the, are the most important features. And this is running on a different set, a uh, feature that I was attempting to engineer. And here you'll see it's, it's pretty low on the list, so this is, this is not a feature that I will probably get a lot of value from. This is the iteration process that I go through with feature engineering all the time. What is really good about feature perturbation ranking is it'll work on really any of these model types. So long as I have a directory created in the Kaggle Utilities format that I use, I can, I can generate one of these. So for example, a Adaboost model. If I open this up, for example, an Adaboost model, if I open this up, I do have the, the, the fold files. There's no perturb file because I haven't ran it for this. But even though the the features or even though the model specific method for Adaboost could be completely different than LightGBM, it is still going to generate one because it is model type agnostic. It's just going to use the fold one pickle file to load the the model that was trained for fold one, and then it's going to generate the the perturbed file in here. Now this is an important characteristic too of the way that I implemented this. I just use fold one. 
I could perhaps get a little more accurate by running this for all five or ten folds, but as you can see, it takes a while just to run it for one fold. So this is really just an estimate of the actual feature importance. You could definitely modify that to make it go uh, to make it go much slower, but but potentially give you better better representation of what features are actually important. I'll show you one last thing in this video, just in case you want to adapt this to other things. The perturb importance, this is where I actually implement the algorithm. And you can see I'm basically looping over the, the X shape, so the number of columns. Shape 0 would have been the number of rows. And I essentially keep a backup copy of the column before I, before I decimate it. And then I randomize, I shuffle it. That's doing the, the card shuffling that I, that I showed you. And then I restore it. If I didn't restore it, it would be like a tornado going across my columns. It would, it would eventually destroy the entire, um, the, the entire data set. So we, we randomize and then restore from what we had. And then at the end, we basically we normalize them by the max error. So this is how we get that 1.0 for the, for the best feature and so on. And again, remember, maximum error is good. The highest, the feature that had the highest error is the most important one because removal of that feature hurt the score the most. And that's my introduction to feature perturbation ranking. This is a technique that I often use to determine which inputs or which set of inputs in some cases are important to my model. One thing that I particularly like about it is in the case of categoricals where I'm using something like a one-hot encoding, I can perturb all, all the different dummy variables and this allows me to get a overall ranking of how important that categorical feature is as well as being able to get the importances of the individual categories. Thank you for watching this video, and if you found this interesting, please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos just like this. Thank you.